it's, um, it's with a bitter kind of irony that I've um, wandered around with an iPad in my hand to deliver a speech about poverty. But um, my eyesight's so terrible these days, I can't read my own handwriting, so I hope you, um, I hope you can understand the irony. Um, as I said, I'm Jack Monroe, I'm a campaigner, I'm a mother, I'm a columnist, I'm an author, I'm a blogger, I'm a rabble rouser, I'm a mess. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit how I got into, well, having all those titles today. Um, according to our Chancellor, and I speak for the UK as a whole, um, because nice try, but um, <laughs> I like you guys, stick around. Austerity is working. And it's a line we hear churned out again and again and again and again, and that wonderful austerity, austerity is working, how well the coalition government and now just the Tory government are guiding us out of that great recession with their master plan of austerity. And at Tory party conference last week, I wasn't there, I have a heart condition, I don't expose myself to those things anymore, he gloated that the hard work of the British people is paying off. But for who? Who exactly is austerity working for? Certainly not the 13 million people currently living in poverty up and down the UK, and certainly not the 1 million people that relied on emergency food handouts from the Trussell Trust last year to feed themselves and their families. Now, most of these recipients are women and children. Sorry to put my smaller feminist hat on here, but I'm going to talk about inequality. I brought a coach over with my friends, you'll see them all over there. Cuts to social security, the public sector and women's aid only serves to widen gender inequality in the UK. In simple terms, women and children are bearing the brunt of austerity measures. Children are carrying on their little tiny shoulders the fallout of the bailouts of banks of decisions made by people in suits before they were even born. On their little tiny shoulders, those children are going hungry at the expense of overspending, irresponsible lending, People in towers in central London making decisions on the phone while they're slightly off their heads. You know, and those kids, they go hungry as a result of that. In 2008, 9,000 single mothers were claiming job, job seekers allowance. Four years later, 159,000 single mothers were claiming job seekers allowance. Let that sink in for a minute. After four years, 150,000 more single mothers up and down the UK were claiming that £71 a week they're supposed to live off for themselves and their children. Half of housing benefit recipients are single women. One in four women are in low paid insecure work like care work on zero hour contracts where income is not guaranteed and instead to be brawled over like the good old days of the dockers fighting each other in the dockyards for the last of the work tokens as their paymasters looked on. I thought we had unions for that sort of thing. I thought that sort of thing was scrapped. I thought that was done, dusted, over with, regulated, but snuck in by the back door. It's not punch-ups in dockyards anymore, it's text messages and racing down to work to see if you can get there before your friends, before your colleagues. Because if you can get there, if you can get that meagre six pounds, whatever it is an hour these days, then you won't go hungry this week. And sorry about your mate, they might, but you won't because you can run slightly faster, you can move slightly quicker, you might have slightly less responsibility so you can throw your kids at somebody so that you can get down to work for whatever little hours your employer seeks that they can give you for that one day. It's impossible to claim benefits on a zero-hour contract because having been in the benefit system, they want to know exactly how many hours you work, they want to know that in advance, they want to know what you earn, and if anything changes, they cancel your housing benefit for four weeks while they recalculate it based on what you earned last week. So you need the same amount of hours every single week, otherwise you don't get any benefits at all. So the people in the lowest paid, most insecure work in our society are the people who find it most impossible to get help. But when I say poverty to people, poverty in the UK, and when I say people, I mean speaking at party conferences, not like this one, because you're a nice understanding people. Generally, I'm met with eye-rolling, scathing denial, because poverty is something else. It's something other. I've done work in Tanzania with Oxfam. People say to me, well, that's poverty. I say, no, we have poverty here as well. It's a different kind of poverty, and it's poverty. <laughs> don't need emotive TV appeals with wide-eyed children in order to understand that children in this country are going hungry. We don't need to be under the rule of a ruthless dictator, although some would argue that maybe we are, in order to 
understand that our society as a whole at the moment is one of oppression and inequality. Over here, the sharp increase in the number of homeless families living in hostels and B&Bs, three or four new food banks opening every week and almost as many closing their doors because they're no longer getting donations. One in five people missing meals on a regular basis. We're not allowed to call that poverty, that's austerity. And the word austerity conjures up, it conjures up images of cosy frugality, as though we're all living in a quaint snapshot of a post-war modern Britain. And I'm surprised that the propaganda hasn't made a reappearance to back up the Chancellor's claims. You know, eat less bread, food is a weapon, your own vegetables all year, all year round, dig for victory, homegrown food, make to amend, keep calm and carry on. Apparently missing days of meals, turning the heating off for two consecutive winters and every bloody day and night in between. It's austerity. It's unscrewing the light bulbs so that you're not tempted to turn them on. It's selling your son's shoes. It's drinking the formula milk that the food bank gave you because it's all you've got left. It's turning off the fridge because it's empty anyway. It's selling everything you can see lying around that you might get more than a quid for. And it's walking everywhere in the pouring rain with a soaking wet, sobbing toddler dragging along behind you, going into every pub and every shop, in walking distance. And by walking distance, I meant seven miles either way from my house, asking them if they've got any job vacancies. It's trying not to go red as the girl behind the counter looks you up and down really slowly at your filthy jeans and your slept-in T-shirt and says, no, there's a sign in the window saying vacancies available, but you know they're not for you. Is it any wonder that you can't get a job? Because you're exhausted, you're a mess, you don't look like you could do anything, let alone set engagement rings to loved up couples in Warren James. You just don't look together enough to get a job, so you don't get a job. You apply for hundreds, 300 before you stop counting. That's not poverty, that's austerity. It's dragging that toddler home after a day of endless no's. No, we can't go to the fun fair. No, you can't have a pop comic. No, we can't go have any sweets. No, we can't go in the toy, toy shop. I'm really sorry shoes hurt, but no, you can't have any new ones. And putting two jumpers on and tights and leggings and two pairs of socks and sitting at home in your coat and your hat because you don't have visitors anymore, so there's no one there to notice. It's trying not to hold your dinner at the wall in desperate frustration. When your toddler tells you that he doesn't want it, you're not surprised. It's Sainsbury's Basics pasta with half a tin of tomatoes pulled over the top that's been opened at the back of the fridge for a week. You wouldn't eat it, but it's all you've got. I don't want that, Mummy. I want something else. And there isn't anything else. You fling all the cupboards open in frustration, try not to yell at an innocent two-year-old because there isn't anything else. It's getting up in the morning and giving him the last of the wheat bits and you mash it up with a little bit of water because you haven't got any milk. And he's sitting across the table hoping that he leaves a bit. And it's when he looks at you and he says, Can I have some more, please, Mummy? Can I have some bread and jam, please, Mummy? It snaps you out of that daydream you're having about how you can carry your tiny little telly to the pawn shop and your guitar and how to tell a two year old that there is no bread and jam. According to Michael Gove, me skipping meals to ensure that my child would eat made me a reckless parent. According to Edwina Curry, me accepting a food bank referral form from the Shawstart Children's Centre meant I was a reckless opportunist. A very reckless, apparently, it's a word that they use a lot. And according to George Osborne, when I slipped my wrist and threw all my beast blockers, sleeping pills and paracetamol down my neck on my bathroom floor while my son was at his father's house, I was doing my bit for the British society. When I came to, sobbing and throwing up, that was the hard work of the British people paying off. You get up the next morning, you jump in the cold shower, you stuff the bailiff letters into the overflowing kitchen drawer of unpaid bills that gives you a bit of fear every time you walk through it because it's just a bursting drawer full of money that you don't have that you owe to people that are going to come and break the door down eventually. You put some long sleeves on, you walk to the food bank to join the back of a 60 strong line of mothers with push chairs, trying desperately to look normal to keep calm and carry on, because you're terrified that if anyone knew how you were living, you might lose that little boy. You're grateful for the tins and the tea and the sympathy, but you just want everyone to stop asking you if you're okay, because you're not okay. Food banks are often the only port of call for some of the hardest to reach members of society, people who wouldn't ordinarily ask for help. People for whom the thought of visiting their local council office to query why their housing benefits have been delayed or suspended is another thing on a to-do list wrapped with anxiety. 
So instead they stuff that letter into that kitchen drawer full of final demands and bailiff letters. You don't say it out loud. So food banks act as a signposting organisation with agencies on hand to offer help for the issues that led people to their doors in the first place. In my particular food bank, there were child and family support experts, debt advisors, welfare support advisors, domestic abuse specialists, drug and alcohol intervention workers, all volunteers, all doing the jobs that used to be done by people who worked for the council before their jobs got cut and now propped up by charities instead. I actually managed to speak at Tory party conference last year. Um, I snuck in on an Oxfam fringe and they tried to ban me the day before, so some researcher must have Googled my name and gone, oh, I don't think we're going to like what she's going to say. And they rang me up and they said, we've had an issue with your pass, Miss Monroe. I was like, I'm coming anyway. <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> my name's down and I've got it and I'm coming in. And I did. Um, and one MP on my panel, Stephen something from Cambridge, said that there were only 565 food bank users in his constituency without a single sense of shame, without a single sense of irony, and they backed it up, like nodding at me for approval, like a little puppy dog. And I've got 82,000 people living in my constituency. I was like, well, well done you. Well done you. There are only 565 families in your constituency are at the point where they are starving. And well done you for being proud of that. Because what use are numbers? We could say only half a million people rely on food banks in the UK. I mean, that's less than 1%. But what use is a 1% chance when that 1% is you? And what sort of society do we live in where people who go out to work every day to provide for themselves and their families cannot afford to do so, but their reliance on emergency food help is justified in a casual statistic, just 1%, just 565 people, just a million. Everyone else is doing okay. And that's supposed to be okay. Why, why was he not ashamed that even one family in the UK can't afford to feed themselves and their families. Why are we not doing more? Why are we not ashamed of that? How has that become so normal that you can walk into your local food supermarket and, um, and there's a neighbourhood collection point for spare tins and cans, that sanitised tesco fied piece of, you know, just saying, this is totally normal. Actually, look, hungry people in your community, please chuck a tin in. Now, I'm totally grateful to the Trussell Trust for everything they do. Um, I, my food bank wasn't a Trussell Trust food bank, but I've helped out and volunteered at them since um, to try and sort of repay the reason. You know, I'm only here because of the help that I had from food banks, and I'm very grateful for that neighbourhood collection point, but I'm absolutely disgusted that it's there in the first place. <laughs> the dead donkey of a big society in action. MPs that pose grinning for the press as they cut the ribbon on their latest food bank opening is a disgrace. <laughs> a refusal to acknowledge that its very presence in their community is not something to be proud of, it's something to be deeply, 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 deeply disgusted by. And the sad thing is, I've been giving this speech for three years and nothing changes. More food banks open. The queue around my local one gets longer. More people go on benefits, more people lose their benefits, more people get sanctioned, more people kill themselves when their benefits get stopped. It's like Groundhog Day of regurgitating my personal testimony in the hope that I can just change some hearts and change some minds and that something somewhere one day might change. The need for food banks in one of the richest countries in the world I went to the G8 summit a couple of years ago to discuss poverty and hunger and um, I was still unemployed and one of the national newspapers thought, I know, we'll ask Jack along to give it some rage and you know, she can write about it for the Independent. And um, David Cameron sat about six tables away tucking into Philip Beef and Violet artichokes and I was borrowing a pound from my editor for a bag of crisps. That's inequality. That's but people assume because you're there and you've got a smart shirt on that you're doing okay. Last year, furious and desperate for change, I set up a petition asking the government to debate food bank use and investigate hunger in the UK. I got 100,000 signatures by the time I woke up the next morning. This is something that people care about and care about deeply. And the debate was held and, you know, <coughs> overridden and overruled by people saying it's not real, it doesn't exist. These people deserve it. They spend their money on facts and tattoos and 
televisions and cheesy chips. Thanks, Jamie Oliver, for that one. But it's a debate that needs to be had again and again and again, and I don't care if I've got to give this speech every day for the next three years. I want change. We need change. all was a disbelief from people on a base salary of about £70,000 a year that poverty existed in our society. Austerity has been sold so hard to us with its spoonful of sugar as George's marvellous medicine, but it's a cancer at the heart of a decent society. And the only people that benefit from it are probably not in this room, probably not in the queues at the food banks, probably not volunteering for the domestic abuse charities and the drug and alcohol addiction services and all the services that all come together under that one roof to try and pull people out of the reasons why they're at that door in the first place. And what can you do? People say that to me all the time. It's one of my most asked things after I give a speech. They say, well, what can I do? Well, firstly, donate to food banks. Seek out your local neighbourhood collection point and chuck into it tins and pasta and cereals and tampax and shower gel and toothbrushes and razors and the odd smart shirt for a job interview. Continue to campaign for the living wage, not the almost a living wage that, you know, that came in a couple of months ago, because almost a living wage is still not a living wage, and the clue's in the name, you need a living wage in order to be able to afford your living costs, otherwise you will rely on top-up benefits, and they're inconsistent and insecure and suspended and delayed and not paid on time and sanctioned and causes all sorts of messes. And get off Twitter and stop arguing with each other. I mean, God. When I left the Labour Party and joined the Green Party, when was that? That was March. I was still getting abuse for it on a near daily basis. I went to Labour Party conference two weeks ago and basically walked around in a baseball cap with my head down the whole time. I was challenged at the bar by people swearing and yelling at me, what the F are you doing here? I was like, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm going to most of the party conferences. You know, stop arguing with each other. Because the thing about the right wing is that when the you know, proverbial hits the fan, they all come together and you know, they knit in their big wall of solidarity and ugliness. And what do we do? We bitch on the internet at each other. Ooh, you're a traitor. Ooh, you're this. Ooh, you're that. And what does that achieve? Because we're strongly united. Agreeing with people from different parties isn't a weakness. It's a strength. It's a sign that you're human. It's a sign that you can think for yourself. That you're empty that you're well-rounded, that you're willing to accept that other people have got some great ideas too. I write cookbooks for a living. My last one was a bit of a mash-up of a bit of Nigella, some of Gordon and most of my mum. Now that doesn't make me a worse cook. It makes me a better cook. By borrowing bits from people that I like and admire and agree with, my cookbooks are better than they would be if I just had to rely on what I eat on a weekly basis, which is mostly toast, if left to my own devices. No one wants a cookbook about toast. So I borrow bits from people who I agree with, and that doesn't make me weaker. And they don't have a go at me about it, and I don't have a go at them about it, because I don't think I'm better than anyone else, and I don't think my ideas are better than anyone else. And if only we could apply the same rules to politics as we apply to cookbooks, which is nick all the bits you like, mash them up together, package them as something new and amazing, and sell it for a fiver, <laughs> we'd be in a lot better place. Because I've been... Someone said, and it might have been Banksy, but of course no one does know who Banksy is, so it might not have been Banksy, said on Twitter a while ago, promote what you love instead of giving your energy to what you hate. And I find that truer and truer. Campaign firmly, but gently, kindly. As a campaigner, I've recently been saddened and bemused by some of the tactics of people who call themselves my peers. Trashing a small business, setting fire and covering it in pain is not building a community. Terrifying women and children and trapping them inside what you have riots and swear outside it is not rebuilding your community. Throwing an egg at a Tory. We've all fantasised about doing it, but guess what? It doesn't achieve anything apart from distracting from the issues and then everybody tasks us all with the same yobbish brush and we'll never get anything done. So, campaign. Organise, research, protest, demonstrate. And tell your stories loudly and clearly and again and again and again and listen to the people who do because we are stronger <coughs> united. 
My friend Hessie Bauer, I met her at a Labour Party conference about two years ago when I didn't have to go in a baseball cap and they actually allowed me to speak at things. She was 107 years old and she marched from Cable Street all the way to the St. Louis Chimene marches a couple of years ago in a yellow mac. And she marched and she marched and she marched and she marched and she always stood up for what she believed in. And she said to me, we must fight. Because if we don't fight, if we fight, she said it much more articulately than me. <laughs> she had had more than three hours sleep. If we, if we fight, we might not win. But if we don't fight, they'll definitely win. Don't fight each other. It's me, I'm ad living now, channeling Hesse. Don't fight each other. It's a waste of energy. Fight the enemy. The enemy is austerity. The enemy is cuts to welfare. The enemy is making mothers and children up and down the country, up and down the UK, hungry, freezing, starving, suicidal. Fight those bastards. Leave each other alone. Thank you. I'm going to get strong.